Welcome to the livelihoods of exclusion, Ghana's hydrocarbon industry and women's lives. Presentation by Sandra Amongen. I'd also like to recognize my co-author, Nathan Andrews, who unfortunately was not able to join me in uh, this presentation today. So straight ahead into the argument of our... So we argue that uh, the interaction of power relations in Ghana influences gender inequalities that dictate the access and management of resources by different resource user groups in the country. So this could be between men and women or between resource user groups from the national and those at the sub-national level. A brief background into Ghana's oil and gas industry. Oil was discovered in 2007 by the Jubilee Partners headed by Talo. Subsequently, extraction started in 2010, whereby Ghana extracted its first oil. Just like in, a, in many other oil extraction companies, I mean, sorry, countries, Ghana experienced high expectations for overall betterment of people's lives in the countries, but also um, economic development in the countries from the in the country from oil revenue. And while this has been observed that Ghana has benefited from the oil revenues, there has been discrepancies in the distribution of benefits, especially within uh, from the national to the sub-national level. While there is development in different sectors at the national level, this hasn't been seen to trickle down to the sub-national level. Looking at women as a center of our study, women have oftentimes been sidelined when it comes to scholarship or natural resource extraction, and also when it comes to policy formulation in regard to natural resource extraction. However, women play a key role in natural resource management and use. So policies and scholarship that continue to overlook the role of women pose a risk of developing programs or policies that don't lead to overall long-term sustainability because they uh, do not consider or they do not put consideration into the role of women in natural resource management. Women in Ghana's coastal communities are involved at the post fish harvesting uh, processes where women are mainly fishmongers but also are engaged in fish processing which involves preservation and fish cleaning. So activities that take place within the ocean have a direct bearing on women's livelihoods because women are greatly involved in fishing as fish processors at that level. But also since the introduction of fishing in Ghana's ocean waters, it has been noted that fishing activities have greatly declined due to the fact that there has been an introduction of fish restriction zones. While these are the zones where most fish tends to amalgamate because of the fact that the rigs have so much light that attracts the fish. So there has been a, a big decline in fish catch since the introduction activity. We use the feminist political ecology framework, which was inception, inceptionalized in uh, 1996. The framework calls for putting gender at the center of analysis in gender and environment studies, but it also looks at the fact that gender relations have an intersectionality with other factors that include politics, economy, geography, race, and even culture. So there is need to look at all these other factors when examining gender in environment. The framework also argues that gender is in a constant state of negotiation. That is to say that gender roles and interactions do differ and keep changing across different social political uh, situations, but also across different environment and different contexts. Also looking at the feminist political ecology framework, it has been underexplored in the context of sub-Saharan Africa due to the fact that feminism is still looked at as a contentious issue in sub-Saharan Africa and also aspects of race are still underexplored in uh, the context of gender and environment. 
Lastly, in this paper, we contextualize feminist political ecology by looking at politics and power, culture and geography, and also touching on some aspects of race. The methodology used, um, the, the, the study was conducted in the Western Coastal Region, looking at the communities of Axim, Discov, and Cape Three Points, and exploratory research design was used, along with qualitative methods that included uh, document analysis. For the first result area, we looked at the interaction of gender and coastal livelihoods, looking at how this has evolved over time. So the study observed that gender still plays a key role in the livelihoods of coastal communities, with women mainly participating in post-harvest processes while men go out to fish. That's to say, that's not to say that this is common across all the communities. Some differences were observed, with Axim being the most um, well-off community of the three. We observed that there are women who are even able to buy boats and employment to go out to fish for them. Women involved in cross-border fish trade with countries like Benin and Togo, but also in Discov, which is similarly not as um, as bad, badly off as kept three points, the women who are able to participate in cross-community fish trade and also in cross-border fish trade. On the other hand, in kept three points, where the community is mostly impoverished, women are mostly participating at the level of fishmongers in the community. The study also observed that women are breadwinners in these communities due to the fact that women have the sole responsibility of providing sustenance for their households. So women will primarily supplement men's income and then use that to take care of household needs, for example, buying the food, taking the children to school, buying medication and things like that. And fishing in these communities is not only looked at as a livelihood option, but also an identity for the community due to the fact that this is an activity that is passed on from generations to generation. And men in the community actually look at fishing as a birthright to them. Diversification of livelihoods is still uncommon. While there's instances of uh, agriculture, farming, and petty trade in the communities, this is still uh, uncommon on the broad scale. Almost 90% of household incomes in most of, the, uh, most of the households does come from fishing to this day. However, some women have tried to diversify into petty trade. The second result area, looking at uh, the expectations versus the reality, the study shows that there's a big discrepancy between what the community is expected and what the re reality on the ground is. For most women, they thought that the oil industry was going to lead to uh, improvement in social infrastructure, especially in Cape Three Point, where they don't even have access to a road or a hospital or even a secondary school for their children. So the other expectation was also that the industry was going to provide jobs. However, only seven jobs have been created across the seven districts, seven communities, sorry, seven, three communities and seven districts. No, the three communities that the study was conducted and these jobs have only been given to the men. So due to the gaps in social service delivery, we've seen that corporate social responsibility has been used to kind of fill in these gaps. However, this is still inadequate. For example, 100 scholarships have been offered to Ghana by the oil companies, 10% of which is supposed to be uh, given to the coastal communities. And in this region, there are over seven districts, so 10 scholarships to seven districts, and they're supposed to be given to the most impoverished children. However, it's been marred by instances of corruption, where some officials ask households to pay in order to have their children uh, put on the list of beneficiaries. So women in adequate income are not really able to uh, have their children put on the list. However, the study also observed that some coping initiatives have been adopted. Uh, for example, traditional institutions um, in this call, the chief provided 10,000 Ghanaian cities towards women entrepreneurship activities. This 
on the other hand isn't really adequate because only women in one part of the community were able to access this fund while the others were left out because the fund isn't really sufficient to go around for all the women. Civil society like The Gift have also promoted agriculture through livestock um, and also crop production. This, however, does not put into consideration women that have no access to land and other factors of production, especially immigrant women. To conclude, the study observed there were some shared but also differentiated experiences of the women across the communities, especially due to their geography, um, their politics, but also their class. The experiences of women in Cape Three Points were not similar to those in Axin because of the Ex the exclusion in Cape Three Points was more because of the fact that the women are more dispossessed even from social services. While examining the impact of oil and gas in the region, it's also necessary to look at other compounding factors like climate change and poor methods of fishing, like overfishing that have already impacted uh, the fishing industry even long before oil extraction was introduced. Then, recognizing women's role in the communities as a means of sustenance is important in addressing women's issues because it brings women to the forefront of the discussion because at the moment women are being left out in decision making processes which impact their livelihoods for example women not being given opportunity to these jobs and yet the responsibility of breadwinning falls onto women in these communities lastly there is need for formulating policies that address the unique experiences of coastal communities and particularly the women because right now while development is being observed at the national level that is not being translated to the uh, coastal level or it's not trickling down to these communities due to the fact that the policies are not speaking to their unique experiences. The last slide shows some of the references that were used in this paper. Thank you for listening.